Shalom. Peace be with you, friends near and far, those watching us live or recorded later on in the week. Welcome to our worship as we carry on with proclaiming the good news, the renewing power of resurrection even as the world around us struggles to breathe and find its stability. We come to this time understanding that it is with God that we catch our breath, that we rediscover that stability and foundation upon which life is lived with meaning and courage, and are reminded that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which strengthens us and works within all of us to bring us together. A few announcements as we begin. If you are watching on Facebook Live, you may chime in on the chat button to send in prayer requests. Others can text my cell phone. First names only to protect privacy, and we will include them in our prayer time. You may want a Bible open before you, as our text this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 to 25, found at the back of your Second Testament, the back of the Bible, almost to the end. Also, you may want uh, something to eat nearby, maybe some crackers or some juice, coffee, whatever is convenient for you. Uh, as we celebrate communion every Sunday in our tradition, utilizing familiar, well-used elements to symbolize uh, what Jesus shared with his friends on that Last Supper. Electronic giving is available via the online button uh, on our church website or the QR code, which will be displayed at the end of our PowerPoint screen during the offering and communion time, and can be scanned from a smartphone and links right into e-giving as well. A reminder that we also have a secure post office box available downtown. Uh, meetings, we uh, are refraining from meetings, but we do have an elders gathering via Zoom or in person here in the sanctuary at 1115 today. Those who are elders or visiting uh, ministers, you've got an email with directions on how to do that by calling in. Um, for the few of you who cannot call in, we will be social distancing around spread out tables today at 1115. We encourage those who come in person to please wear a mask, and we will have a sanitizer spread throughout. Yale will be sharing our special music this morning, in addition to leading us in our songs. The song that she is going to be singing is from our Chalice Praise, our small songbook. It is entitled, Let Us Go to the House of the Lord. Each Sunday, we look forward to having special music in our time of worship uh, from one of our many talented musicians. And we welcome Kim this morning as a second service elder who will be sharing in our communion and offering time. So now, dear friends, I invite you to take a few deep breaths. Turn loose of the distractions and burdens which have weighed you down this week. Focus on the presence of God which surrounds you where you are right now. As you breathe in, imagine those you know who are also worshiping with us this day, wherever they are. Allow yourself to envision all the world united in praising God despite the suffering that is upon us. And as you breathe out, release any suffering or pain over to God who eases our load and lifts us up, that you might find strength and be brought together as one people in God in a spirit of calm and meditative focus as we listen to the prelude that Sonia plays for us. Let us be in a spirit of worship.
Imagine you are in a space where there is comfort and safety. In a place where you are, you can leave behind anxieties and fears, weariness and cares. In the place where you are, God is offering you bread to feed your every hunger and still waters to refresh your soul. Come find that strength in the place where you are to follow in Christ's footsteps as we worship together. Let us pray. God of grace, you come to us in many ways, including through your child Jesus who set an example for us about how to live in difficult times. You grant us new strength so that we might love beyond our frustrations, so that we might endure the sufferings of our times and continue to do good on your behalf. You reveal to us, O oh God, in the wounds and the suffering of Christ, a path to healing. And it is in these wounds that we are healed. Heal us now as you mold us into those who will live out your purpose on this earth. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our song this morning of praise is wonderful words of life. I invite you to join together in singing with Gay. exceptionally good and blessed hands. 
Please pray for Summer Young's mom at Mercy Hospital with blood clots in her lungs and needing a heart transplant eventually. She will be going to a rehab facility in the near future. Ron Schmidt's good friend and pseudo daughter Annie, her brother, was found dead in his truck in Chico this weekend. Prayers for Annie and her family as well as for Ron as he seeks to support them in this time of crisis. Bonnie Sterling has just signed up for another round of physical therapy as she recovers from her stroke. She is celebrating that she can now be on her horse in her arena for a limited time and is working very hard to get back to fully riding. Uh, recovery from this is a very difficult thing, so encourage her and keep her in your prayers. Prayers for all those who are infected with COVID, those who are on the front lines, and those struggling financially, emotionally, and spiritually. Growing awareness that uh, those who are most affected are the ones who also battle poverty, racism, injustice, and other diseases in our society. Keep in your prayers uh, Diane's daughter-in-law, I believe, uh, who uh, needs our prayers. Uh, are there others that have been shared? Um, Susan asked for prayers for her neighbor, Jean, who went to hospital yesterday. Susan S. asked yes. for prayers for a neighbor who went to the hospital yesterday. Uh, others? That's all that I see. Kathleen? I'd like to pray for those struggling with mental illness right now. Those struggling with mental illness uh, right now, it, it becomes even worse in times of crisis, and the uh, burden is doubly hard. So pray for all of those that are battling this uh, illness. If there are no others, then I invite you to welcome God's presence in your hearts as we go to God in prayer. God of the least of these, God of the suffering, God of those who have so little yet battle so much, we bless you for the ways you send what is most needed in times of great distress. You bring about beauty and creation around us. You reveal tiny miracles in comforting words. You lift us up to sing your praises in dark valleys and clear mountaintops. We pray now for your intervention to bring about healing and an end to the continuous pain which is plaguing our world in epidemic portions. We plead for a breakthrough which will turn the tide on the most deaths in our nation that we have ever seen in this century on our own soil. Reveal to us how we can support recovering and healing around us and in us. Work within and protect our first responders that they will feel your loving arms holding them up when they grow faint, giving them endurance when they are overwhelmed and offering them wisdom when they seek resolutions. Be with those we have named in this time, both verbally and deep in our souls, whose names only you can hear. Teach us how to live by the example set by your son, Jesus. Show us how not to be abused when we have been abused not to return violence and vengeance when we have been wronged, but to discover forgiveness and through our healing, find the ways to walk in your steps. Be that shepherd and guardian of our souls that we so desperately need when we go astray. We pray all these things in the name of the Good Shepherd, Jesus. Amen. 
now we welcome Gail to share some special music with us. Holy Word. 
So I had the opportunity to be with my mom about a week ago, and we watched the 2019 movie Harriet together. It is an autobiographical film about uh, the abolitionist Harry, Harriet Tubman, documenting her thrilling escape from slavery, her courage, her ingenuity, tenacity, and faith work together within the Underground Railroad to help free hundreds and hundreds of slaves and change the course of history. My mom remembered that I had studied her as a student in elementary school and how my 93-year-old mother remembers something I have no recollection of, I cannot tell you. I learned several new things about Harriet, including that she was chased by white and black trackers, which greatly surprised me. Apparently, for some blacks who were free, the money was not easy to resist. You could buy a farm, feed your family, and get, uh, live a really good life with a bounty paid for simply two slaves caught. The film did a great job portraying the dangers and the suffering endured by those who dared to do what is right, to do God's will, standing up against an evil system, not succumbing to the temptations of wealth and power. The whole story reminded me of our scripture in 1 Peter 2, a very difficult text, but one that offers encouragement to those who suffer that others might be saved. If we start with verse 18, a verse that was actually left out of the lectionary reading, it could be argued that this is one of those verses that should never, ever be read aloud in public. I choose to do so now because it lays out the context for the rest of the scripture and the necessity for biblical and scholarly interpretation of the Bible. The author who is writing in the spirit of Peter begins the section in verse 18 by saying, Slaves, accept the authority of your masters and with all deference, not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. It gives me shivers to hear those words. It was a text that the black preacher was required to read to his small congregation in that movie as slave owners and wives set in on the service, nodding in appreciation as they heard it. Then and now, the phrase seems horrifying in the presence of abused women, enduring pain and ongoing beatings tortured children living in oppressive households, and any human being who has been unwillingly placed in a slave-like atmosphere. So just what do we do with such texts that have been used to harm other people? It is one thing to read this text in the midst of the Roman government, which was a tyrannical dictatorship. And it discriminated on the basis of race. It favored those who were privileged and ignored those who were poor and waged war on its neighbors. Now, each of us have to decide for ourselves how closely we resemble such a government today. But that original form of slavery that was known in biblical times and was also played out in our nation's history has thankfully been eliminated from our soil. In biblical times, however, this scripture was understood as a household code, guidance for how household members were supposed to live. A Roman household, you see, could be quite large, uh, making up parents and children, extended family members, and other dependents such as slaves who are engaged in household-related activities. Because there were a vast array of roles and activities in that household, it was understood as a microcosm of a much larger society. 
subordinates such as slaves and wives who threaten the stability of the household also threaten the stability of the state. So as I watched the movie Harriet, I couldn't help but ask myself what First Peter's words might have meant at the height of the American slave trade. Walter Wink notes that 150 years ago when the debate over slavery was raging, the Bible seemed to be clearly on the slaveholder's side. Abolitionists were hard pressed to justify their opposition to slavery on biblical grounds. Those opposed to slavery had to find other sources of authority. Part of that authority came from the slaves themselves, both their experience of slavery and how that shaped their interpretation of scripture. For those of us on the whole who love the wisdom of scripture, those wonderful words of life, Scholars will challenge us by asking, how do you think it is that a people enslaved by a people of a book that is the Bible come to accept that same book as authoritative and legitimate? New Testament scholar Vincent Wimbush responds, the most Defensible explanation certainly lies in a meeting of worlds with its stories of underdogs surviving and conquering and of a savior figure who is mistreated but who ultimately triumphs. Is it any wonder that the Bible came to be embraced by African Americans? Again and again, the real situations of the heroes and heroines appeared to be similar with the historical experience of African Americans. For those who were enslaved, the Bible itself became a testament against oppressive text because Jesus ultimately says that all of the law is to be summed up with one definitive commandment to love God and love neighbor. All scripture must be weighed by that ultimate commandment. Therefore, texts that demean and diminish our neighbor have to be called into question. So as we explore this controversial text, take note that it is generally agreed that this was a sermon which was preached at a baptism. As a result of their new birth, the newly baptized are encouraged to embrace this radically different set of values and behaviors that follow in the footsteps of Christ. Believers are invited to live in a way fitting of the people of God, even though they live among those who abuse and mistreat them. The household code therefore offers a strategy for how Christians honor their socially prescribed roles while finding a totally separate system of honor in God's household. So in the footsteps of Christ, they might find themselves living on that edge, sometimes in difficult and dangerous situations, for the love of God and the love of neighbor. If that happens, we use the tools which are given to us and stand up against the isms of our society. That is those things that are the exact opposite of loving God and loving neighbor, such as racism, ageism, sexism, and so on. In this crisis that we are currently living in, However, I feel compelled to call out a misinterpretation that has gotten some folks in trouble, not only with society, but I believe with God. Some have said, as a Christian, I don't have to obey the state. I will gather in crowded worship services or anywhere else that I want to, no matter what anyone says, because I trust God first. Friends, there is a difference between trusting God and testing God. Driving too fast on the freeway, passing when it says not to pass, ignoring health guidelines from medical experts, 
supposedly trusting God to save you if you jump off a cliff because you will suddenly float down like a feather, something Satan implied to Jesus, is what prompted Jesus to say, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, it won't end well, not just with society, but with God. The majority of us, it is true, don't find living in these times very easy. For some, it is the hardest thing that we have ever done. Suffering day in and day out has become a reality sometimes too painful and difficult to acknowledge. But our text reminds us that being good citizens may mean we will suffer. However, God's grace is always active within our suffering. When we seek to protect the vulnerable and readily honor the sacrifices that medical professionals are making on our behalf 24-7 and not protesting in their faces as they painfully shake their heads saying, forgive them, O God, for they know not what they do. Then we are seeking in our author's words, the approval of God, first and foremost. When any of us suffer, we can come to see our lives reflected in the life of Jesus, who also suffered for the good of others, but ultimately triumphed. Howard Thurman understood the kind of suffering this meant. In the midst of suffering racism, he redefined himself and his children so that they could become victorious. He shares that one day they were in a procession on the way to a baptismal ceremony in the, Halif in the Halifax River near Daytona Beach. When they passed a white public school and his daughters saw the swing sets, they jumped for joy saying, look, daddy, can we go swing after the baptism? And this was that inescapable moment of truth that every black parent in America must face sooner or later. What do you say to your child at that critical moment of encounter? You can't swing in those swings. Why, daddy? When we get home and have some cold lemonade, I will explain it to you. Once they got home, his little Anne pressed him for an answer. He said, it is against the law for us to use those swings, even though it is a public school. Only white children can play there. But it takes the state legislature, the courts, the sheriffs and police, the white churches, the mayors, the banks, the businesses, and the majority of white people in the state of Florida it takes all of those to keep two black girls from swinging there. That is how important you are. Never forget that the estimate of your own importance and self-worth can be judged by how much power people are willing to use to keep you in the place they have assigned you to be. You are two very important little girls. Thurman refused to, to let the unjust laws of racism and exclusion define him or his daughters. No matter what the world said, he had been set free by God, never feeling the need to test God with his actions, but instead steadily working to change the system from the inside out. As our scripture says to us, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in the steps of Jesus. May it be so. Amen. We are going
going to join in a song called Step by Step, reminding us that we are being called this day and every day to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. was so steep, no one else had been able to ride a skateboard down it. It was called Bodie Hill, mainly because the Bodie's house was at the top of it. Brad Bennett, the best skateboarder among us, tried once and wound up in the emergency room with a broken wrist. We usually got up the hill about two-thirds of the way, and you, uh, but you would pick up some, so much speed by the time you got to the bottom that the wheel, wheels on your skateboard would wobble violently. Bodie Hill was on concrete. One week, the bullying of my brother was worse than usual. One afternoon, while we were all skateboarding in the street, my brother Wade walked out of our house with his yellow skateboard. The bullies made fun of the yellow skateboard, too. Wade walked up to the top of Bodie Hill. All the kids stopped and stared. Wade turned around, got on his yellow skateboard, and rode it to the bottom of the hill. The speed he picked up was incredible, but not the slightest wheel wobble. At the bottom of the hill, he stopped, picked up his skateboard, went inside, probably played the piano. Nothing but stunned silence followed. He never rode his skateboard again. <laughs> and bullying stopped. That was classy. My brother is my hero. This week, let's be especially mindful of all our unsung heroes those essential workers keeping society working, those staying home even though they can't afford to in order to keep others safe, those in our church who reach out, check in, see how you're doing. We're riding down Bodie Hill right now. We can crash or we can be classy. 
Let us also remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for all of us. On the night before he died, he broke the bread and took the wine with his friends. He did this for remembrance of his message, and so that his message would live on through all of us. Let us join in communion. Remind your dear friends that you are loved. I love you. God loves you. The friends and family in this congregation love you. We miss each of you. And there will be a time where we will gather in this house of the Lord once more. But in the meantime, God is in your house always and forever. So remember that wherever you are, God is with you. So go, dear friends, from this time of worship, and may the shepherd and the guardian of our souls lead you through this week, sheltering you from harm and guiding you to follow in Christ's footsteps. 
that you may endure to do what is right and good by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen.